Okay, thanks, Steve. Okay, we're open it up for questions to uh, anyone online today. And again, we encourage you to type those into the chat box. I have uh, pulled one question off so far. First thing I'd like you to do at this point as we're gathering those questions is to answer the polls that are here. Uh, you'll see four questions there on the screen. Uh, which group your comments best represent? Where do you work? How many people are viewing at your site? And do you participate in a program that requires continuing education? Uh, all this information is really valuable to us as we continue to evaluate how we continue to develop the Livestock and Poultry Environmental Learning Center and to our grant supporters. They also appreciate uh, the number of this information for us to, to help uh, demonstrate impact of, of the center. Uh, the one question that we have so far actually came in quite early. Uh, it was from Levi Smith and it said, how do you get landowner or producers to adopt some of these techniques for better riparian management. I guess we could open that up to any of the speakers. Um, maybe to get it going, let's we'll start with Jim. Would you like to tackle that one? Again, the uh, question is, how do you get land or producers to adopt some of these techniques? Sure, Joe. It would seem to me that, and, and, I, and I think, uh, again, we definitely want Tom to uh, discuss this because uh, he would be, but it seemed to me probably uh, twofold. One is certainly uh, any type of incentive uh, that one can have through the equip program uh, or any other uh, program through uh, uh, USDA uh, should be helpful in that. And that's probably the primary incentive. Again, that uh, the the but the other the other point too is I think uh, to some extent uh, that. Uh, is, is helpful to just rely on uh, the producers, um, well, let us best say uh, ethics. Uh, that again, that that uh, uh, it, it's rather amazing as, as as we've done this work down in southern Iowa, uh, uh, working with the uh, Rathbun Land and Water Alliance and the producers that are associated with that. Uh, it has really has really been uh, quite a uh, wonderful uh, experience. Again, these these folks, and, and that's a combination of regulatory agency folks, uh, producers, uh, non-producers. But again, they recognize that uh, that lake is the water source for something like seventy thousand people, and uh, everybody has a has a buy-in on that. So to to some extent. Uh, What's been interesting is just the the interest in, that uh, the producers have themselves in uh, in uh, improving that. So I think that combination of uh, of, uh, of of again uh, financial incentives, uh, uh, but then also just a, a person's individual values. Tom, you want to say something about this? Uh, sure, Jim. You know, we have, um, through our work in uh, our Bear Creek watershed in north central Iowa and others, we've worked uh, extensively with private landowners. And, and uh, you know, I echo that fact first about in incentives. Um, <clears throat> we have to recognize that in any change in land use um, for these landowners, there's going to be opportunity costs associated with it where they're trying to make a living on slim margins. Um, and so that uh, if there's goods, if the goods are going to be received off-site, um, we probably need to offset those opportunity costs um, through incentives. And then um, we've seen um, that as, as it relates to that, we've seen establishment of these uh, sort of riparian practices and riparian buffers increase during um, some periods of low uh, return from cropland or pasture land and, and increase as land values and rents have increased. Um, but then, then uh, we found that it's a, it's a very retail sale. Is that um, we need to work with private landowners and first ask them what their objectives are, and then only start to tailor the practices or the management to meet those those specific objectives. Because um, I found that it, while it might be those incentives that put them on the land, it's meeting those objectives and the other values that they see accrue over time that are going to keep those practices on the landscape. Okay, um, tied in with that, we have a question that's come in from Tom Shipley. And the question is, how do we get absentee owners to participate in the expenses? 
with little if any return to them other than to raise uh, uh, their lease rates. Uh, this is Tom, and, and again, and, and uh, an, an excellent, excellent question because, uh, as the question recognizes, there are there are differing um, accommodations in, depending on the lease between those landowners, uh, absentee landowners, and the renters, and that's an active area of research. Um, and and uh, I guess that uh, while not an answer, what I'd offer is that uh, if you uh, go and look at it. A firm here in Iowa called Agrin Incorporated. They have done a study on that using a conservation innovation grant um, and have some really nice recommendations out, specific recommendations out about how to address that absentee landowner issue and uh, and get them to uh, uh, to buy into some of these practices. And that's Agrin Incorporated. Okay. Um. One additional question uh, here from Washington State, up near the Canadian border by George Boggs. Coliforms are present in soil, so what, so would you expect to see in CRP ground? Why did you not test for fecal coliforms? Which case would you expect a correlation with virus? So it's kind of a multi-point question there. This is Steve, I'll try to answer that one. Uh, the coliform, there are coliforms in soil, but not not at the uh, not at the concentrations we were able to see in the in the water. So we so we feel like probably the the biggest contribution to coliforms is, is going to be from a, an animal or a human. Uh, and and the reason we and the reason we use the coliform test as a as our measure of, of bacterial contamination of water is because the EPA has has established that as the, the, the test to use for uh, bacterial pathogens in water. There's a standard methods that, they, uh, that they've approved, and uh, we wanted to be able to, you know, to compare our data to previous data or general work with um, you know, bacterial contamination of water, and that's, that's the standard, uh, standard way to measure water is just Total coliforms per 100 mil, uh, and so that's the reason we didn't break it down any farther than that. And, and the viral, the viral part of the study really was just to look if if we could see any viruses in the water. They're not commonly uh, they're not commonly looked at because they're a little more difficult to measure than trying to do a coliform test on the water. And we also wanted to see uh, if cattle could, you know, if grazing animal would would uh, uh, if there would be any viruses from grazing animals, enteric viruses, and if they would survive in the water, you know, long enough that we could even measure those. So uh, that that was the reason that was the approach that we took for for the um, bacteria and the viruses in this study. Yeah, with regard to the virus, would there be any correlations with other indicator organisms if you weren't to culture for the viruses? I think that was you know part of the question. Um, I would, you know, since there are fecal-borne uh, viruses from bovine, uh, you'd expect to see some kind of correlation with the uh, fecal-borne organisms, the bacteria from the cattle. But uh, what, you know, what we what we were able to to look at, uh, we had we had uh, we weren't really able to correlate the coliform counts that we saw in the water with any. You know any any uh, degree of presence of the of the virus that we found in cattle at all. Okay. And then uh, we can kind of tie it in with this in the CRP data that you showed. What uh, what's your theory behind the CRP showing counts of uh, higher fecal uh, bacteria? Full forms. Uh, I don't know. We were we were surprised about that. We expected to you know uh, be able to have. Lower counts there to be able to see if any of the strategies we were using in those in the 13 farms that we looked at to see if any of the strategies would change the water leaving the farm. But uh, you know, there's you know, it looks like it appears you know there's there's got to be some kind of a contribution you know from the CRP ground that that doesn't involve the cattle. The uh, other wildlife potentially. Yeah, potentially. We we, we just don't know. I mean, we didn't. We didn't find any evidence of any. We didn't investigate those very fully, you know. But we didn't. We didn't. Uh, we didn't find any, uh, you know, any sewer, any sewage system runoffs, or 
you know, any other reason that would explain why those counts would be higher going into the pasture than going out. Okay. And the next two questions are kind of tied together, so I think I'll, I'll try to wrap them together. One talks about bacterial source tracking specifically and just what's your general thoughts, but one before that uh, asks about what availability or tests to identify specific species from which the bacteria or the virus originated. In other words, um, when you go out and run these tests, could you sure say it was from the cows versus other critter? No, that, that's our biggest limitation right now. We need to try to do a better job to be able to, to, be able to answer that question because uh, the tests we have now are just uh, too generalized. You know, we can we can measure the contamination, but we have no no easy way. You know, no uh, easy way anyhow up to this point to identify where where it actually came from. Okay, so your general thoughts on bacterial source tracking? Uh, good approach, uh, skeptical approach. What's your no, I think that'd be great. I'm I'm waiting for somebody to show me how to do it, and we'll we'll sure try it. Okay. Um, this is going to go back to, uh, to Tom, I believe. Uh, there was a question about pasture bank erosion study. Were there uh, significant differences in the soils in those areas that you studied? Uh, yes and no. And um, we tried to, um, uh, in, the, in the detailed analysis of the data, we tried to do a, um, a stratified random subsampling of the soils by those uh, different soil series or soil mapping units. Um, and uh, see if that is a, a significant variable. Um, many times we do not see. Most times, actually, we do not see um, be, and see many differences, um, or that being an important variable. And that's probably because of this, and that all of these soils, while they might be uh, their sources might be a little bit different, most of it's post-settlement alluvium uh, in these riparian zones. Um, so it's uh, the artifact of uh, historic erosion settling in these riparian zones, and, and uh, uh, that is part of the issue because these uh, these soils are uh, don't have much structure and are pretty weakly coherent, and so they're uh, um, uh, pretty open for uh, erosion. Okay. And we move back to another question on source tracking. Uh, come in from Doug Boss. I thought there had been some work on DNA source tracking. There is some work. I mean, I think that's a direction everybody wants to try to go. There's just not anything uh, very practical uh, or anything easily adaptable to field research right now. Yeah. All right. Um, well, if that's all the questions that are coming in via the chat, we'd like to thank you for your attendance today and hope that you will attend in the future and share uh, with your colleagues uh, and friends the, the opportunities there are for these webcasts. Um,